I use linkages controls. Well, the obvious answer is to get rid of the linkage, being linkageless, getting rid of that one-foot mounted actuator as we saw in the prior slides on the left, uh, getting the ability to, in some cases where flue gas recirculation is required for NOx control, getting away from the linkage, that can be somewhat uh, tedious with that. We allow more uh, control over the burner. In this case, we can use a milliamp signal to operate as opposed to the old 135 ohm or series 90 pressure controls or temperature controls as they were called. Another significant benefit is we can keep the burner in low fire to allow warm up uh, so we don't actually turn the burner on and allow it to release to modulation, which will typically take it to high fire. A lot of thermal shock. Here what we can do with these systems is actually hold the burner in low fire until we maintain or, or pilot or, or pilot hold. Yeah, depending on the flame safeguard. Exactly. Uh, keep the burner down in low fire until we maintain some minimum water temperatures, or minimum pressure before we release the modulation. And then one of the more significant benefits of the linkages solution is that it's very difficult to tamper with. So if you have an end user that tends to want to futz and play, and every time you come back there to do a tune-up, uh, you find things a little amiss, you can relax and enjoy that uh, a lot of the linkages controls today are passworded. There are serial numbers for the actuators, which make it very difficult to change the actuator out by accident and uh, affect the combustion setting. So uh, there's a lot of technology on the software side that prevents some of the more common problems from occurring. Another benefit as we get into the linkages controls is that we can actually assign a different ignition point from a low fire point. So picture in your mind the jack shafted solution again. When the actuator returns to low fire, it can't go any lower than low fire. Low fire is low fire, so that's essentially where your ignition occurs. Well, many times a burner can operate at a lower, lower fire than it can be lit at. So essentially you have to increase your firing rate just enough to get a stable, safe, smooth, uneventful ignition but your operating point can oftentimes be less. So where you have a turn down limitation, and turn down means essentially the difference between your high fire input and your low fire input, you want to maximize that generally, where you have a very limited turn down, quite often the burner can be made to behave better by operating with a lower low fire. So where you have a, a mild heating demand, let's say in your spring or your fall or your process requirements in the morning or night, are such that the boiler is really grossly oversized, what's going to happen is the boiler is going to fire, it's going to satisfy based on temperature or pressure, and it's going to shut down. And it's going to do that more frequently with less turndown. So if we increase the range of firing, what it'll allow is the burner to run longer at a lower firing rate before we satisfy our temperature or pressure controller. And what that means to you is energy savings. Because remember, every time that burner is going to fire, it's going to go through a pre-purge cycle, a post-purge cycle, and really all essentially you're doing is pushing the air through the boiler during those pre- and post-purges that you just paid to heat. So that boiler, instead of becoming a generator of, of steam or hot water, it actually becomes a radiator. So we eliminate some of the cycling associated with the burner by increasing the turndown. That's essentially what we're looking at. And we've had uh, some instances where the fueler ratio savings was paling compared to the increase in turndown. It was very beneficial for the customer. So we maximize burner efficiency. In some cases, uh, perhaps you've seen these where boilers, again, don't have characterizable trim on the fuel control. And what that means essentially is you're continuously playing with ball joints, the radius of a ball joint from a uh, damper pin you're playing with where the uh, push rod ends up in the ball joint. Essentially, you're, you're changing the radius of the linkage, the characterization of the linkage, to match the fuel in the air. And unfortunately, on boilers that are fitted with no characterizable trim, you really do hit the sweet spot at one point on the curve. So, And by curve, we're talking about the range of travel from low to high fire. And unfortunately, you're living with a compromise situation as the firing rate either is called to increase or decrease. So it, it, unless you've got an awful lot of time and a good deal of load, and remember you need that when you're, when you're setting your boiler up, unfortunately if you don't have a lot of heating load, the boiler's continuously turning off as you satisfy the operating control. But if you 
get to that point where you, you can put that much time into it, yeah, you, you, you can probably hit it at a few points, but ultimately going to the linkageless technology allows you to hit the sweet spot in terms of fuel and ratio and emissions continuously from low to high fire. And it's a lot easier to do than playing with the linkage and, and suffering through the hysteresis and the fact that by the time you're in your truck, uh, that is probably working less optimally than, than it did a, an hour before. So linkageless offers these benefits in terms of maximizing efficiency. There is applications where we fire uh, multiple fuels. It's very common. Uh, these systems in, in every case can be set up, as we had seen actually in one of the other pictures, to operate natural gas, fuel oil. Uh, the simplest linkageless system from Honeywell can, can handle two fuels. So if you've got a vaporized propane backup, uh, you can certainly do that. Uh, some of the more exotic systems from FireEye can have up to 10 servos. So you could have one for your combustion air, maybe one for flue gas recirculation and eight different fuels. Not sure we'd ever use something like that, but the capability is there should you need it. And uh, keeping in mind the fact that uh, when you fire, a, especially fuel oil, you typically would set the boiler burner up on fuel oil first because the fuel oil is going to be a little harder to ignite at the lower firing rate. So that's essentially going to establish your low fire. After you get that done, you, you uh, execute your startup on gas. Unfortunately, you, you further limit the turndown on natural gas there because your force draft damper settings have been established by fuel oil firing. Some people get around that by having multiple uh, damper setups when transferring between gas and oil, which makes the operator have to relocate linkage to fire oil versus gas. It, going linkage lets we get rid of all of that. So essentially if you tell the control system that you're firing oil, the servos arrive at their new position, which were established at startup. If you're firing gas, those home positions kind of kind of change based on that need. So it simplifies life for the operator. You know, we can have uh, multiple fuel curves, one for each, or in the case of the fire ice system that we'll talk about later, multiple curves there for different servo combinations. Yeah, and um, I can't stress enough that in, in dual fuel applications, this is where you can really increase your bottom line on fuel efficiency and energy efficiency because the because uh, because the, the the separate curves that are available for both air and gas it just it, it, it exponentially increases the fuel savings yep so looking at applications mm -hmm. yep what we're going to be talking about here is um, boilers ranging from as low as 50 horsepower um, up to I mean when we've done boilers up to uh, 60 thousand pounds per hour steam boilers um, it, it really all depends on the application and how they're used, whether it's uh, a process application, uh, how often the boiler is used during the day. Um, in some applications, uh, John mentioned, it wasn't an energy saving so much as it was the t amount of times in a day that the boilers turned on and off. Um, in that application, we had boilers turning on and off in a four-month period 20,000 times because of the way they were sized and the, the loads that, that, that they saw. And just reducing that to five or six times a day provided them with an ROI to put to put a system in like this. It was actually interesting because Chuck just recently had a claim safeguard retrofit mm -hmm. where we had a mechanical programmer in place. The thing was worn out. They really couldn't figure out why. They retrofitted it with a flame safeguard from Honeywell that actually told them the number of cycles. They started watching that, and that's what kind of uncovered that opportunity. Mm -hmm. We put it in and, and greatly dropped the number of cycles per day. Yeah, and, and that and that a lot of times is an is, is an overlooked feature of, of the linkages controls. It's, 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 it's the increased turndown is just huge to, right. to be to be able to to have the boiler running at, at, at in lower um, lower areas of the uh, firing rate curve. Um, as far as um, expected results that you should see, um, we, we've seen everything from from four to ten percent uh, fuel fuel savings on, on on the boilers, and that's with obviously the increased. Uh, turn down on the boilers. And some of that has to do with just uh, getting rid of the linkage. Some of it has to do with the fact that the boilers in some conditions weren't tuned for a while. Some are the, uh, the type of trim used for the fuel or ratio control. So we, we kind of cover all that. Mm -hmm. 